have some very productive staff meetings. You can't tell. That is actually one of our more productive staff meetings. Uh, no, in all seriousness, like, can you believe some of the stuff that people choose to believe? Or in this case, not believe? I mean, how can someone not believe in Bigfoot? The evidence is all around us. Uh, we are starting a series today called Urban Legends. And, and maybe you're familiar with some ur urban legends. Uh, there's some really popular ones. Uh, I remember really kind of the first one I ever heard. All right, I remember it because, uh, because it, was, it was pretty serious stuff. All right, I, I was in first grade. We were, uh, I attended Wigan Street Elementary School, uh, just down the road here. And, uh, they were taking our first grade class along with some other classes uh, in Kenyan to their art exhibit. Because that's what every first grader wants to do. You go look at art, you know, and you critique the art. Uh, we were on the way, and on the sidewalk, uh, we kind of got in line next to some older groups that were walking at the same time. And one of the older kids that was walking beside us said, Hey guys, be careful. Don't step on that crack or you'll break your mother's back. I was shook, all right? I was legitimately afraid for my mother's back. So I spent the next few minutes carefully avoiding every crack that I could see um, until it finally got to the part where we were slowing down too much and our teacher, Mrs. Brown, was yelling at us and I didn't like to be yelled at, so I decided to sell my mom out. I just stepped all over those cracks uh, and she survived it. But I remember like, being legitimately afraid of that. Uh, I remember being told, you know, if you swallow bubble gum, it'll stay in your body for seven years. Uh, I remember hearing the story about if an oncoming car uh, is coming towards you and they don't have any lights on, do not flash your lights at them because they may be a member of a gang and their initiation is to come beat you up if you flash your lights at them. Uh, so, you know, here in Eastern Knox County, we get a lot of gang members. Just drive around without lights on uh, and I have not flashed my lights at any of them, right? Uh, a new one that's pretty popular and slightly humorous to me is a monster energy drink, all right? Maybe you've heard of those monster energy drinks. Supposedly, if you understand uh, Arabic, all right, and you turn it upside down, uh, and, and you look at it, like, you kind of like cross your eyes, and you spin around while you're doing jumping jacks and hold it real far away, uh, the M stands for 666, all right? The mark of the beast. And so people online will say that if you're drinking monster energy drinks, what you're really doing is supporting the church of Satan. All right, when in all reality, all you're doing is supporting your local dentist, right? Uh, these are all urban legends. You've probably heard of a lot of these. Uh, you're probably familiar with a lot more. Uh, and they're all untrue, right? They're urban legends. We're going to look at some spiritual urban legends, some spiritual uh, beliefs. Uh, and and the, the first one today to, to start off with is, I think, one of the most important things in every Christian's life to decide this before we like go any further in our faith. This is one of the first things that we have to be willing to decide. All right, there's, a, there's a popular spiritual urban legend that there are many ways to God. That there's many ways to God. In other, in other words, people can take a lot of different routes, but the end destination is the same. It's kind of like if, if we all in here wanted to go to Disney World, and we were all going to drive separate, you know, the, the thought is, you know, you can take a map and everybody can pick a different way, but we're all going to end up in the same place. People carry that logic over to their faith. And they say, you know what, we all want to be with God, we all want to be in heaven, but we can take whatever path we want, okay, because they're all going to lead to the exact same place. So today, we're going to look at that urban legend. And, and like I said, it's an urban legend that in, in reality, all of our eternity hinges on this answer on the possibility of this being an urban legend or being truth. Uh, next week we'll talk about a, another spiritual urban legend that I think really affects a lot of people, especially in the American church with, with you know, kind of the way that we live our lives and the way we go through things. I'm really excited to do that, but I think this one is really important for us to start with. All right, that, that idea that, that all roads lead to God. Because you can turn on talk shows, right? So before we moved, we didn't have satellite. So I didn't watch a lot of like talk shows, I didn't watch a lot of political shows, anything like that. 
uh, and, and now we have satellite, and I, and I turn it on, and, and on talk shows, on regular TV shows, uh, you can hear people talking about God. Quite a bit, really. Um, you can get on uh, Twitter, which is just like a whole different world online. You can get on there, and you'll see people talking about God. It's actually pretty common right now to hear people talking about God. And, and, and people will say things, well, you know, as long as you're sincere, as long as you're sincerely loving people, if you do enough good things, you know, that, that'll lead to God. That's the message. And I'll be honest with you, it kind of, kind of feels good, doesn't it? It kind of makes us feel all warm and fuzzy inside. It's easy to believe. But the question is, is it true? Uh, and here's where I think things are different maybe than uh, just in some recent years past. Because like I said, you can turn on TV and you can, uh, you can flip over to, to Oprah. And you can hear them talking about God. You can, you can flip channels or you can hear people talking about spiritual things. You can hear people talking about karma, about positive feelings about all these different things, but you know what you don't hear them talking about? It's Jesus. You don't hear people talking about Jesus. You start talking about Jesus, and everybody freaks out. There was a, a popular show a couple years ago uh, uh, called Duck Dynasty, right, where they follow these guys that make uh, like, like duck calls and other <laughs> duck things, all right? Um, and, and this is a, a very like, Christian, strong faith based family and, and what's really cool is like so they would do the show it was always really you know humorous and fun and whatnot and at the end of every episode they'd get together and they'd have a family meal and they'd always pray before their meal uh, and they prayed the way most of us do they'd say their prayer and say you know the name of jesus or in the name of your son you know something to that effect referencing jesus or talking about jesus uh, the producers of the show told them you know you we'll cover your prayer but we can't allow you to, to say that on TV. You can't say in the name of Jesus. You can't say your prayers in the name of Jesus. So if you go and you watch some of those episodes, you'll see that they cut all of that out from their prayers. Because you start talking about Jesus, and people get a little freaky, right? They get a little squir squirmish. That they're not crazy about it. All right, so are there many different ways to God? Or, like, our religion, like, we believe is Jesus the only way? Now, maybe you've experienced this, I don't know, but whenever you say that Jesus is the only way to God, a lot of people tend to write you off. Right? They assume you're very narrow-minded, they assume you're very judgmental, uh, you're closed-minded, maybe they'll call you legalistic for believing that, or, or super conservative, whatever they, they want to call you. Whenever you say that Jesus is the only way to God, people write you off. And that's why we need to understand, is it legend? Or is it truth? And so this morning, we're going to look at the claims of Jesus. All right, because hardly anybody believes that Jesus didn't exist. Like, so historically, uh, it's very, very easy to prove that Jesus exists. Like, that, that wouldn't take long. Uh, you know, we can prove that but very easily that Jesus existed. People really don't dislike his teaching for the most part either. You know, you flip through the Gospels and you read about, you know, what he's teaching. You know, love people to turn the other cheek. You know, people don't really dislike that teaching. What they dislike is his claims. His claims. His claim specifically to be the Son of God. To be God. His claim specifically that he is the only way to God. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open it to John 14, 6. John 14, 6, this is a, a really cool verse uh, that, that hammers this point home. If you don't have it underlined yet, go ahead and, and, and do that now. There's pins in the chair in front of you. John 14, 6, we're going to be in and around John most of this morning. John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And then he goes on to say, no one gets to the Father except through me. So there's only one way to God, Jesus said, and that's through him. And that brings up the point of debate. That brings up the thing that people don't like about Jesus. It's his claim that he is the only way. If you, if you have your Bible open, uh, go ahead and flip forward a couple chapters 
to John chapter 10, verse 30, uh, and then we'll, we'll kind of read on from there. John chapter 10, verse 30. He says, I and the Father are one and the same. I and the Father are one and the same. It says, again, the Jews picked up stones to stone Jesus, who was also a Jew. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many great miracles from your Father. For which of these do you want to stone me? He said, we are not stoning you for any of these. We are stoning you for blasphemy, because you are a mere man. And what does he claim? He say, you claim to be God. Those are the claims that freak everybody out. You got Buddha, Confucius, Muhammad, uh, the Dalai Lama. None of them claim to be God. That's what separates Jesus, and that is what offends so many people. And, and like I said earlier, let's be honest, deciding on the answer to this is one of the most important decisions that you could ever make. It is the most important decision, one way or the other, they will ever make. I love looking at our lives and looking at the choices that we make on a daily basis, you know, and the effect they have. Uh, you know, even, even simple things that we don't even really think about anymore. You get in your car and you drive a specific way to work, you drive a, a specific way to church, and you make these decisions and, and you decide to go this way or that way. Sometimes they have just like crazy effects on us. I love looking at the decisions and how all these little things add up to big things. But let's be honest, a lot of times our life is full of really silly decisions, right? Like, like miracle whip or manifest. Clearly, it's the tangy zip of miracle whip. <laughs> right? Uh, Coke or Pepsi. Don't even try to bring your Coke into the argument. Like, that's not even, that's not even close. Uh, here in, in Knox County, you maybe have gotten caught up in this, like, just a super like, tough, turf war between Ford and Chevy, right? Uh, you know, I, I've never been picky. I'll take whatever runs the best, you know, and, and consistent. Uh, but Ford or Chevy, uh, my friends tell me that everyone knows, everyone knows that Ford stands for first on race day, uh, although the Chevy people will say that it stands for found on the road. So I don't know, you know, I don't know. Uh, another, another, you know, another decision is East Knox thing, right? You know, you gotta pick, you gotta choose, all right? You gotta choose the side, uh, you gotta choose which, which way to go there. Okay, those are, those really ultimately are kind of silly decisions. They, they're not gonna matter into eternity. You know, there, there are gonna be uh, Coke fans in heaven, there are gonna be Pepsi fans in heaven. Uh, the, the, the Chevy people will probably be there if their car doesn't break down on the way, right? Uh, but this decision here, all right, deciding what, what we believe about this, without overstating it, without overselling it, without uh, exaggerating it, our eternal destination hinges on the way we answer this question. Are there many ways to God, or is Jesus the only way? Because here's the thing, if Jesus is who he says he is, if he's the son of the living God, if he's born of a virgin, if he's lived a sinless life, and he says, you must deny yourself and follow me. If all of that is true, then we should surrender every aspect of our lives. Everything we have, everything we do, we should give every bit of everything we have, being empowered by God's Holy Spirit, to pursue him, to live for him, and to live for his glory in every single way. Okay, now on the flip side of that, if on the other hand, the claims of Jesus are not true, then we shouldn't be here. Like, like, this makes no sense at all for us to be here. If the claims of Jesus are not true, we should never come back to it again. Because this would just be a social club. This would just be one big joke that's taking time out of your Sunday morning. So we have to be willing to answer this. Legend or truth? Is it true or not? Where do we fall on? And so we're going we're gonna to put Jesus to the test. We're going to look at his life. We're going to look at the things that he's done. And we're going to start by testing the credibility of Jesus. How credible was he? Because a lot of times, when you get closer to things, you start to discover that sometimes they're less impressive than you thought. Uh, I, I experienced this as a, a child growing up in the 90s, and it was awesome, right? It was before you had phones, it was before you had a lot of internet everywhere, and uh, you, you know, you gotta do some really fun stuff. Like, I love 
And, and this, this sounds, you guys, I mean, you guys get it. I'm going to go. Okay, like, we've been there. We've covered that. I love sitting by the radio all day with a tape, all right, <laughs> and waiting for that favorite song to come on the radio. And then hit record as quick as possible, open the DJ and shut up so he's not talking into your song, right? And then you record this song off the radio. Um, one of my favorite artists uh, of all time, uh, Vanilla Ice, right? He, he wrote this really, like, just like deep, meaningful song. It just it hit me, right? It hit me, it hit me right there. It's Ice Ice Baby, right? I love, I love Ice Ice Baby. Uh, you know, and, and I, would, I would put that on, and I'd stand in front of the mirror, and I'd dance, and you know, do all my stuff. And, uh, I did a remix called Ice Ice Baby. See what I did there, right? Ice Ice Baby. Uh, but I, I, I love that song, right? As far as I know, it's really the only song he ever wrote. Okay, so, you know, I was like, that's, that's a great song. Like, it was fantastic. Fast forward uh, to when I was in high school, and uh, we had traveled down to Cincinnati to do some to, to catch a red game and to go to, uh, it's called like Newport on the Levee, it's technically in Kentucky, and we're, we're doing all this stuff, and I saw a poster that said that Vanilla Ice is putting on a free concert on the Levee, all right, and I'm like, we gotta go, because as far as I know, that's the only song he's ever written, is Ice Ice Baby, and so I'm gonna go in, and he's just gonna play Ice Ice Baby on repeat, on repeat, and there's gonna be millions of people there, it's Vanilla Ice, right? Uh, that's what I had pictured. We get there, we walk down, there's like 15 people standing in front of uh, a really pathetic looking stage, and, uh, and he's seen songs that I don't even recognize. And so I waited around for a little bit, waited around for a little bit, and it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And I thought, you know what? Nope, this is not the vanilla ice. I remember, the closer I got to it, he, he didn't hold up to what I was looking at. So we're gonna look at the claims of Jesus. We're going to test his credibility, and we're going to examine a couple things. First of all, we're going to examine what people said about Jesus. Not just his fans, okay? Because that's really easy, right? That's really easy to just look at the fans of Jesus and what they say. Not just his disciples. We're going to look at a couple people who have a reason to dislike Jesus. Uh, the first one is Pontius Pilate, all right? If you know history, he was under a tremendous amount of pressure to crucify Jesus. Uh, he wanted to find any sin, any sin, any fault, any excuse to give to the crowd. So Pilate examined Jesus. And then John chapter 18, verse 38, uh, he asked this. He says, what is truth? And, and it says, with this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no basis of charge against Jesus. Another translation says, I find no fault. Basically saying, he's not done anything wrong. Let's try this. The next time that you think that you are the Son of God, go into work and ask, do you find any fault in me? What have I done wrong? Or if you want to get real, all right? If you, if you just want to get real, go to your wife, go to your husband, say, hey, do I have any faults? I did this to Jill, and after she stopped laughing, uh, she said, do you want the whole list or, or just the top 100? <laughs> uh, Pontius Pilate was looking for something to find wrong with Jesus. That was his goal. Then he says, this man hasn't done anything wrong. I can't find any fault in him. Look at what people said about him. Uh, the centurion and some of his buddies who were at the crucifixion of Jesus, they were on the same side of the crowd that wanted Jesus crucified. They wanted him dead. Uh, if you know the story, after Jesus gave his life, uh, the ground shook, the temple veil was torn. And in Matthew 27, 54, it says this. It says, When the centurion and those who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that happened, they were terrified. And they exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Okay, so they looked on at everything that was happening and they said, Okay, this, this guy has to be the Son of God. He is who he said he was. And these are the people who wanted Jesus crucified. So examine what people said about Jesus uh, was the first thing. The second thing we're going to do is let's examine very briefly, what Jesus did. Okay, he was well known, he was famous uh, in that time and now for his teaching and for his miracles. In Mark chapter 6, verse 2, it says, What's this wisdom that has been given him that even he does miracles? Think about the miracles of Jesus. Think about what he did. He healed deaf people, he caused the mute to speak, uh, he healed up a, a guy with a shriveled hand, he cast out demons, he multiplied five loaves of uh, bread and, and 
few things to fish, to feed 5,000 men, plus their wives and children. Uh, he walked on the water, he calmed the storm, he raised the dead, and nobody, not even the Pharisees who hated him, debated the validity of his miracles. They just wanted him to stop. They just wanted him to stop. Sure, yeah, he does miracles, okay, just stop him. Let's examine what others uh, say about him. Let's examine what Jesus has done. And if you're taking this, let's examine what God did. If there's any one thing that pops out in the scripture about Jesus and what he did, it's, it's that after he died, he was raised back to life. In fact, it was Peter who was at Solomon's colonnade. He was talking to some of the men of Israel, and this is what he, what he said in Acts 3, 15 through 16. He said, you killed the author of life. He says, you killed the author of life. What did God do? It says, that God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses to this. He said, you know what? We didn't just hear about it. We saw it. We are witnesses to this. Now, there's a lot of debate here. And as I said earlier, no intelligent person will debate whether or not Jesus existed or not. Historically, it's very easy to prove that Jesus existed. Uh, no one's really going to debate the quality of his teachings. You know, you know to, to love people and to forgive people. Uh, but they'll debate this point. Was Jesus really raised from the dead? Some people will argue and say, well, no, it was the Roman soldiers. They stole the body of Jesus, and so he's not really risen. Uh, if that's the, the argument, you have to really think about it, because the Roman soldiers would want nothing more than to produce Jesus' dead body when these claims were made. Um, a lot of people will, will say that the disciples stole the body of Jesus. That's another claim that you'll hear. Uh, and, and if you have a really good imagination, this one's kind of easy to, to believe, too, because you have to imagine that these unarmed, untrained uh, fishermen, tax collectors, doctors came in and overpowered the best of the best of the Roman guards. Um, and and, and that on top of that, you would also have the testimony of the guards who could say, you know what, I was standing there, I was on duty, I was doing my thing, and, and that fisherman, he just he overpowered me, and he took the body of Jesus. So that claim doesn't really hold up. And, and then think about this. Okay, there were 12 disciples. We know Judas took his own life. John died at old age. How did the other disciples die? They all died to death at a mark. So after severe persecution and torture, they lost their lives for the cause of Christ. Now, would you die for a lie? Do you think these 10 men would die in that brutal, graphic of a way for a lie? The scriptures tell us that Jesus was spotted, and that there were witnesses, and that there, there, there were those who saw him. Uh, there were those who saw him on the mountainside. They saw him in the upper room. According to the book of Acts, there were over 500 people who saw the risen Christ. Think about it. Ask yourself, do you really expect any rational thinking person to believe that 11 ordinary, uneducated men devise the most grand scheme in the history of the world, hold it off, kept it a secret, with no motivation for personal gain, uh, but actually quite the opposite. They pulled off this elaborate hoax with severe personal costs, uh, being hated, despised, rejected, abused, tortured, and eventually killed, all in order to cheat the world into being a better place. Urban legend, truth. The claim is there are many ways to God. And like I said, in our politically correct world, that feels pretty safe. It feels right. It's not going to offend a lot of people. Yet Jesus makes this claim that would offend a whole lot of people today. And he says, there's no way to the Father except through me. All right, the second thing we want to do is we want to test the character of Jesus. Is he who he says he was? Was he a man of God? Was he a man of integrity? John 8, 46, Jesus asks this question. He says, can any of you prove me guilty of sin? He says, if I've done something wrong, prove it. Point it out. Just tell it to me. What have I done? Prove me guilty of sin. He says, if I'm telling the truth, why don't you believe me? When it comes to the character of Jesus, we really only have one of three options. Okay, the first one is, like the rest of us, we can assume Jesus was a liar. Right? Like, that sounds really harsh. Uh, but the reality is we all lie. And if you're saying, well, I don't lie, you're a liar. Okay? 
I remember discovering this. Um, it, it, was, uh, it was also in first grade. This was Brown Scott. So a lot of things happened that year. Um, but I came in, and, and, and I was super tired. We had done something. We were out really late, you know, in my first grade mind. We were out really late. And we came in, and I was just so tired the next day. And I remember telling uh, our uh, like assistant teacher, she was like a teacher in training, whatever they call those, like I'm blanking on that. Uh, student teacher, all right, it was our student teacher, and I remember telling her, like, oh, I'm so tired. I was up to like 10.30. You know, that just seemed so late in my world then. Uh, I was like, oh, I'm so tired. And then, you know, the kid beside me was like, oh, I'm really tired too. We were out till midnight. I was like, oh, wow, like, that's weird. And then the other kid's like, well, I was out till 4 in the morning. Like, I just fell asleep right before I had to get here. And the other kid's like, well, I stayed awake all night. I remember sitting there thinking, we're all liars, right? Like, I don't think any of that happened, really, you know. Uh, it just kind of struck me right then. We're all a bunch of liars. Uh, and so we can maybe make that choice, right? We can look at Jesus and we can say, maybe Jesus was a liar, right? And if he was, you've got to admit, he was a really good liar, right? Because most liars uh, are not that persuasive. That he was able to persuade 12 guys, hey, leave your businesses, leave your families, leave your jobs, leave your careers, and follow me around for three years. All right? Uh, and we're going to be poor, and we're not really going to have any place to stay, but yeah, come follow me. Uh, he uh, also would have been that good of a liar at sticking to his lies. When I worked in a group home uh, with, with troubled teenagers, and we'd get a lot of them lying to us. Uh, and rather than just like call it out right, I like to like, I like to make them have to like double down on their lie or change it. You know, like, they, you know, they would, they would say something, and I'd be like, oh, oh, okay, you played for the 76ers, huh? show, me, show me some of your moves. You know, and they're like, well, you know, maybe I can't right now. But, you know, with Jesus, right, if he was a liar, you would think at some point he'd hit a breaking point. Maybe it's when they arrested him, and they threw him before this crowd, and they're all cheating, crucify him. Maybe that would have been his breaking point. Uh, or maybe it would be when they pulled out uh, the whip, you know, with the pieces of, of metal and glass and bone fragments on the end, and they're ripping his flesh off of his back. Maybe then he would have broken, and, and he would have said, you know what, I'm lying. But maybe he was really committed to it, and he stuck with it, and, and, and he said, you know what, I'm going to keep sticking to this lie. And he went all the way to the cross. And as they pulled out those giant stakes that go through his hands and to go through his feet, maybe then he would have broken so is he a liar? Another option is he was crazy. All right. Another option is he was crazy. He was a lunatic. Maybe he should be locked up in a mental hospital. Uh, I like the story of a guy who was walking by the mental hospital, uh, and it was surrounded by this, this big wooden fence. And in one part of the fence there was a hole, and then right above the hole was a sign that said, "Don't look in the hole." Okay. Don't look in the hole. Now, if you're like me, your curiosity will get the best of you, right? And for this guy, uh, he gets closer to it and sees that sign, uh, and he hears uh, somebody saying, 13, 13, 13, 13. And the sign says, don't look in the hole. So he's really curious, and he walks over, he gets a little closer to it, and he sticks his, hot, his eye right up into the hole and looks inside, and a finger comes through and pokes him right in the eye, and then hears the voice go, 14. 14. 14. <laughs> All right, so maybe, maybe Jesus was a lunatic. Maybe he was crazy. Uh, think about David Koresh, Jim Jones, Marshall Applewhite. These are all people who had a Messiah complex. They believed to be God or to be the Messiah or to be some sort of deity. Uh, they all had a history, though, of disturbing behavior before that. And so you think about Jesus, the most loving, the most generous, the most kind, the most perfect person who ever was. You can say he's either a liar, or a lunatic, or we have one option. We have one option left, and that is, he is Lord of all. He is the Lord of everything. Uh, today, a lot of people, uh, you know, outside of the church, don't have a lot of respect or admiration for Jesus. I think a lot of people don't really understand who he was. I think a lot of guys, especially, look at Jesus and they think, or are the picture of Jesus, right? And they think, well, I can do that. Uh, and, and I think they see Jesus as kind of this poor uh, Galilean peasant. Uh, and and that's, that's kind of the picture that we've painted of him. Right? But I want you to think about who the Bible says he is. 
The Apostle John, when he was exiled on the island of Patmos, uh, he had this vision of a returning Christ. Uh, and I want you to see if this person demands more respect, more reverence, more worship uh, than they do the way we've pictured it. <coughs> Revelation 19.11. John says, I saw heaven standing open, there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on a white horse and dressed in fine linen, white clean. And out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the wine press of fury of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty, and on his robe and on his side, he has the name written. What is that name? King of kings, Lord of lords. He is the King of kings, and he is the Lord of lords. Think about Jesus, if you will. His public ministry lasted only three years. His public ministry was three years, and yet his very birth splits time into four Christ and after his death. <coughs> Scripture says that there is no name that is above that there is I'm sorry, there is one name that is above every single name, and that's the name of Jesus. And so, as we get ready to close this morning, I just want to ask you, what do you believe? What do you believe about Jesus? Jesus asked his disciples at one time, he says, Who do people say that I am? And they, they said, oh, you know, you're, you're all these kind of people. You're, you're Elijah. You're John the Baptist. You're one of the prophets. And then Jesus looked at Peter and he said, Peter, who do you say that I am? Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of God. So let me ask you, who do you say he is? Who do you say he is? If, if you only get one thing from the message this morning, listen very carefully to this next part. Not just who do you say he is with your lips, but who do you say he is with your life? Because unfortunately, many times for a lot of us, there is a big difference. Who do, you, who do you say he is with your life? Not just with your lips. Not just, yeah, yeah, I go to church, I was baptized, I carry my Bible, I say the right things at the right time. You know, yeah, 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 he's my savior. I, I, I got it. I got the whole Jesus thing down. No, not just what you say with your lips. What do you say with your life? The last seven days, this is last week, what would your actions say that you believe about Jesus? Who do your actions say he is? Lyle Hammer entered this home last week for us. If Jesus is Lord, and you really believe that, here's probably a little snapshot of what your week looked like. You saw him through his word. Because his word is the bread of life. And, and, and you love and you enjoy being in his word. You were probably on your face worshiping him quite a bit. Not just here on Sunday mornings. You were probably praying like crazy. Spending a lot of time in prayer. Uh, probably more time in prayer than you spent, spent worrying or gossiping about things. Uh, I can guarantee you were looking at people in your life. People that you were friends with, that you are family with, that you work with. And, and, and you were trying to figure out how you could help them to get them to pain because you really, really care. Let me tell you what you weren't. You weren't concerned about your job that much because you know eventually it's going to burn up and go away. You weren't concerned about having a picture-perfect house because you know that that is also temporary. You weren't concerned about your temporary car, your temporary clothes, uh, going to the gym and working out because you know all of that stuff is temporary. What you were concerned about is the thing that matters most. Jesus. Your relationship with him and pointing people to him. I'll be, I'll be honest with you. Truthfully, when I look at my actions, oftentimes they don't really reflect the Lordship of Christ. Okay? That's just me being brutally honest. If I look at the way I just described the way a week should look, oftentimes I say with my lips that Jesus is Lord of my life, but I don't always live it with my life. And so it's really easy and it's really popular to say, yeah, there's many ways, God. It really is pretty easy. 
it's a lot more dangerous to actually think that. Do your homework to come out on the other side of that and fall on this. And that's, that's who he is. He's my friend. He's my savior. He's my redeemer, my righteousness, my rock, my shelter, the bread of life, the gate, the door. He is my salvation. He is my Lord. He is the only way that I have access to God. And if there had been another way to get to God, then Jesus would never have had to have been born. So I want to ask you, and this is in a moment of self-reflection, you look at your life and the way you live, who do you say that Jesus is? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you so much. And, and I pray that this week, we are motivated for our lives to match what our lips say. Lord, help us to, to, to seek you first in everything we do. Lord, help us to, to, to go to, to prayer in the good times and bad times in our lives. Lord, help us to, to live our lives so differently that the people around us can't help but wonder, what is different? Lord, I, I pray that, that when we struggle with things, that, that you give us the encouragement, you give us the motiv motivation, or you give us the, the kick in our butt that we need to seek you. Lord, we thank you that we have this opportunity. We thank you for the gift of your Son and for his love for us. It's the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. This morning, uh, we're going to offer this time of invitation. And, and there's probably two groups of people here at that church today, at this service, really any other Sunday. There's probably a group here this morning uh, that has already given their life to Christ. And this invitation time is just, okay, check out, uh, you know, I, I can do whatever I want. This invitation time, I'm inviting you to look at your life, to challenge yourself to make Jesus Lord of your life. Not just say it, but to live it with everything you do. That's the first group. The second group of people that's probably here today are the people who have not made Jesus Lord of their life. They have not died to themselves. They have not fleed their sin and pursued God with everything they have. This morning, I want to encourage you to take those steps. Uh, if that's where you're at, you can come forward and you can accept His grace. You can accept uh, the forgiveness that comes only through Him. You can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit when you die to yourself and in your immersed rising up to live your new eternal life. If that's the group that you're in this morning, won't wait, won't wait, for things to be perfect, won't wait until you know everything. Take that moment and come forward now as we stand and sing.
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we ask for your blessing here today as, as we uh, prepare to leave, return to, to our homes, uh, to, go to, home, to go to work, wherever it is that we're going. Uh, Lord, I, I pray that uh, your blessings upon each and every one of us. Lord, uh, I, I pray that uh, we can stand firm in, in the fact that, that you loved us so much that you were willing to die for us. Uh, I pray that we're motivated to live our lives differently this week because of that truth. Lord, we thank you for who you are. In your son's name that we pray. Amen. In this